Hi, my name is Balvinder. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the various methods of turbinate reduction, especially laser, so that the patient can be well versed and make an informed decision based on solid scientific evidence. One day, a patient requiring turbinate reduction walked into my clinic. He was mentally prepared and had come to discuss the method and book a date. After explaining to him how the surgery will be performed, the first question that came out of his mouth was, Doctor, do you do laser surgery? Before I could answer, he whipped out his phone and showed me this review, expecting me to give a positive nod of approval. What was written in the review was rather disturbing as it not only promoted laser, but more dangerously it painted conventional surgery in a bad light, which to me was totally unacceptable and to the layman a dangerous and false statement. Why I say false will be apparent by the end of the video. This was my defining moment which made me make this video in the first place. I help patients with ENT problems understand their problems in the first place and then doing the bare minimum to achieve the best outcome. Laser has many uses in medical treatment and in ENT it is mainly used in larynx and e neck for cutting and ablating especially for cancer and vascular growth. Did you know that laser is probably the worst choice for turbinate reduction and sinus surgery? Laser surgery is beyond any doubt a bad choice because the long term if not lifelong consequences can be devastating. Today I am going to show you the various methods of doing turbinate reduction but focusing more on the laser and medial flap turbinoplasty and help you realize which is the best option based on research studies. This is how I am going to do it. I will talk about uh, turbinate and turbinate hypertrophy using a video and then we will talk about the goals of turbinate reduction and also touch briefly on the main types of turbinate reduction methods. But mainly we will be focusing on laser and medial flap turbinoplasty and all this will be based on research and then there will be a take home message. So let's get going by showing you an animated video on turbinate swelling and its treatment which you may skip if you are well versed with this condition. Significant role in breathing and that enlarged turbinates may contribute to nasal obstruction. Within the nose are three small, bony structures called nasal turbinates. The turbinates help to warm, humidify, and cleanse inhaled air before it reaches the lungs. If the turbinates become inflamed due to infection or irritation, air flow through the nose can be obstructed, leading to symptoms such as congestion, headaches, snoring, or frequent sinus infections. Without treatment, Chronic swelling of the turbinates may last for months or even years and can become irreversible. If you suffer from enlarged turbinates, there are several treatments which may restore normal airflow through the nasal passages and to the lungs. An important step in preventing enlarged turbinates is to minimize exposure to allergens and irritants. Using a humidifier can also help to soothe the air you inhale through your nose. If symptoms persist, your doctor may recommend nasal or oral medications, such as decongestants or antihistamine sprays. In some cases, turbinate surgery may be required to restore normal airflow through the nose. Turbinate is made up of bone, which has a irregular and uneven surface and is slightly curved, as you can see from the CT scan here. On top of the bone is the submucosa, the area which gets swollen, making it hard to breathe. On top of this is the mucosa layer, which is a layer that must be preserved together with the submucosa. The mucosa and the submucosa is the medial flap, shown here in the picture and picture video, which has been separated from the bone and folded upwards. Medial means something closer to the center of the body. Soft tissue contains erectile tissue with glands, which secrete mucus. A mucous membrane with a covering of hair like structures called cilia which moves the particles trapped in the mucus out of the nose into the throat where it is swallowed. Mucociliary clearance is an important airway defense mechanism and in a f if affected can cause many diseases of the airway. In this video, although there are five different methods of turbinate reduction being compared, I will mainly be comparing laser with medial flap turbinoplasty because I want patients to understand what really happens when these two procedures are performed. 
First off, we'll start off with radio frequency ablation, which works by heating a small area of tissue shown in red. It can be done as an office procedure perform and is performed under local anesthesia or under general anesthesia together with other procedures. Other modalities like coblation or submucosal laser ablation can be done in a similar fashion. So, there are three ways of doing this submucosal ablation, radio frequency, coblation and laser fiber and the results are roughly the same. Anything done submucosally is not precise due to two reasons. It is being done blindly as we cannot see and done by feeling with the particular instrument being used. The slightly curved nature of the turbinate bone and also its irregular surface makes it almost impossible to stay only in the submucosal layer with a rigid straight instrument. Partial turbinectomy is where some of the turbinate is cut out. A micro debrider is used to cut off the lower one third of the turbinate as shown here in blue and usually involves only removing the mucosa and submucosa. Submucosal turbinoplasty is a procedure where a shaver is used to decrease the size of the turbinate. A small incision is made in the front end of the turbinate to give access to the 3 mm shaver to be tunneled into the submucosal tissue of the turbinate. The shaver removes the submucosa but this is easier said than done. As you can appreciate in the picture and picture smaller video here that it is not precise due to two reasons. It is being done under the mucosal layer as you can't see and blindly by feeling with a rigid instrument. Secondly, the slightly curved shape and also the irregular surface of the bone makes it almost impossible to stay only in the submucosal layer. Finally, yet importantly, the submucosa is just slightly thicker than the diameter of the shaver resulting in the mucosa being accidentally removed at times. Laser ablation. I have a, s a number of patients coming to me for problems associated with the nose or eustachian tube one to two years down the road after having undergone laser surgery in the Klang Valley. This video itself was actually given to me by one of those patients. Superficial laser ablation reduces the turbinate size by removing the mucosa and the submucosa. It is like making a person slimmer by removing their skin and subcutaneous tissue and fat. Laser can be of two types. The one as described in the first video showing radio frequency that is submucosally or like how it's being done as shown here which is alarmingly being promoted in a positive light by a very small number of ENT surgeons in Malaysia. Submucosal resection with lateral displacement that is being compared in this video has been further improved upon and the new technique is now known as medial flap turbinoplasty. Medial as I mentioned before means something closer to the center of the body and lateral means something further away from the center of the body. The medial flap turbinoplasty is a technique where the most important medial mucosa and the submucosa is left totally untouched. The only part that is removed in this procedure is the bone which makes up about 25% of the volume of the turbinate as shown in red and the attached lateral mucosa shown in blue. It requires a higher level of surgical skill and also it is time consuming taking about 3 to 4 times longer to perform than laser surgery. You will see for yourself in the rest of the video that for results in so many aspects this is by far the best method for turbinate reduction. Although the groundbreaking six year studies cited by almost 300 other journals compare six methods, we omitted cryotherapy and only compared five common methods. Having said that, we shall be focusing mainly on laser and medial flap turbinoplasty. Green means a positive aspect of the technique and yellow means a negative aspect. Pink color are the functions and factors which are really important when making a decision and have been well validated by this and other studies. We will be talking in more detail about the properties highlighted in pink after this. So I'll just briefly touch on those properties not highlighted in pink here. First row, the medial mucosa is not damaged at all during turbinoplasty, whereas it is totally ablated in laser and partly in other measures. 
submucosal damage there is none in medial fat turbinoplasty but it is very extensive when laser is used erectile property of the turbinate absolutely no loss of the function for medial flap turbinoplasty but some degree of loss is present in all other methods medial flap turbinoplasty takes three to four times longer to perform and requires a higher um, greater amount of surgical skill bleeding is much less in laser there is almost no pain in all modalities crusting is much more and for a longer period in laser as mentioned before, the data for this comparison study is mainly derived from a landmark study cited by 294 other journals so far. 382 patients were divided into six different groups and followed up over six years and many parameters were observed with the key ones being the sustainment of long-term results, the preservation of mucociliary function, the preservation of the local immunity production. This study is one of the only two which meets the rigid criteria of Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. This study is a randomized clinical trial and one of the only two studies that has the maximum evidence level criteria for surgical interventions and the one that followed up patients for the longest period. Many studies quote the study used in this video due to the solid science behind it. Let's now talk about the important criteria that were highlighted in pink I mentioned before. Secretory immunoglobulin A has an important role in the nasal mucosa to protect the human body from the outside environment. As by now, after COVID, the whole world knows that is where the airborne virus or any harmful environment agent lands when we breathe in. Normal concentration of immunoglobulin A in nose is 80 to 100 mg per 100 ml. Laser patient falls to 10 to 15 percent of their value immediately after laser and remains at that value all through the six years, whereas medial flap terminoplasty patient maintains 50 to 75 percent of normal value from year one to year three, and by year four onwards reach normal or almost normal levels. This is a huge difference as far as the first line of defense of the body is concerned. It will not come as a surprise if someone were to do a study of laser turbinoplasty patient out there and find out that they were more prone to COVID or other infection after laser as compared to before. Mucociliary clearance as discussed earlier is very important for being another barrier of defense. Another important function of it is that it transports microparticles trapped in the nose by the thin layer of mucus and transport them to the throat to be swallowed and destroyed by the acid environment of the stomach. The normal mucociliary transport time is 11 to 15 minutes from front end of the nose to the throat. After laser, it takes twice as long to transport even after six years. In medial flap turbinoplasty, the time taken is not um, much affected and by third year, it is almost back to normal level. The data for this is from another study and has been used in this video because many patients who have surgery for deviated nasal septum end up having turbinoplasty done on the opposite side at least. The study shows that the enlarged turbinate on the opposite side of the deviated nasal septum has a much larger bony component than where there is no DNS. Bone makes up 39% of the volume of the enlarged turbinate in a DNS patient, whereas it makes up 27% of a turbinate where there is no DNS, deviated nasal septum. Therefore, laser turbinate reduction for enlarged turbinate in a patient with DNS would result in only 18% increase in the volume because the bone is left behind, whereas mucosa and the submucosa is burnt. In medial flap turbinoplasty, where the important mucosa and submucosa is preserved and bone is removed, there is a 64% increase in the volume, a vast difference of volume of 3.5 times that of after laser. Relief of nasal block, that is the one and only outcome patient wants from the turbinate reduction. This outcome is seen immediately after any procedure, even though a bit less in some, but when compared to the mean volume of 4.8 cc before surgery, the difference is still significant and patients know wiser what, had under, what they had, that they had undergone a substandard procedure. 
Let us assume 12.5 cc is the best possible and safe outcome. Then medial, turbino, medial flap turbinoplasty maintains 88% of the 12.5% ideal result throughout all the years, whereas laser is 72% in the first year and drops every year to be only 35% of the ideal volume from year 4 onwards. Most people will be convinced by these data alone to reject laser when I actually I feel they should be equally if not much more concerned about the permanent loss of local nasal immunity and the loss of mucociliary function. There is another important recent 2016 study comparing five-year results done by world-renowned Australian rhinologist Dr. Raymond Sachs and Dr. Richard Harvey. Laser surgery was not even meant compared due to the subpar and inconsistent results seen over the previous two decades. This is also the study that gave a more suitable name to the original procedure known as submucosal resection with lateral displacement. It acknowledges the higher level of surgical skill required and as a result more time required which could be the two main reasons why very few ENT surgeons in Malaysia use this method. This method meets all the criteria for an ideal surgical reduction. It preserves the mucosa, it preserves the physiological function therefore maintaining the sensory function and humidification of inspired air, it removes the obstruction which is what patient wants the most. 97.5% of patients were still very happy five years after having undergone medial flap turbinoplasty in this study. The choice is yours. On the right is medial flap turbinoplasty just three months after the procedure and on the left is laser a year after. Four main factors you must take into consideration are shown. Top left hand, loss of innate immunity of nasal mucosa Endoscopy will not be able to diagnose that and patient will also not be able to sense that it is connected to the laser procedure. Top right hand, loss of mucociliary function. Again, this happens at microscopic level and not diagnosed by endoscopy. A laser nose will take twice as long to clear any mucus from the nose. Bottom right hand, results deteriorate as years goes by and by fourth year, laser patients are left with only 35% of the ideal expected outcome, whereas medial flap turbinoplasty results are sustained at 88% of ideal. Bottom left hand, Laser is the worst procedure anyone wants to do if they have a DNS as a greater portion of the bulk of the turbinate consists of bone. The already poor result by year 4 will be even worse in cases associated with deviated nasal septum. So we have already gone through the comparison in detail and just to recap, just make sure that the technique recommended to you does not damage mucosa or submucosa has no long-term effect on the immunity of, the, of your nasal mucosa, has no long-term effect on the mucociliary transport mechanism, gives the best results when combined with deviated nasal septum where the bone component is larger, about 30 to 40 percent, has long-term permanent results. I hope that I've help those in dilemma better understand the option and equip them with the knowledge needed to make an informed decision based on solid science. Please do not forget to click like and subscribe to my channel if you would like to view more such frank videos. Thank you and wishing you the best of health.